Awesome. Hi everyone, welcome to Power BI for Enviros. Uh, we just started the recording, so we got lucky. <laughs> so the recording, as per usual, we've made available both our YouTube channel and also in the, um, in the blog post and the meetup group as well, so we'll share that after. Um, and just a general Teams tip, you can zoom in to sh sh content being shared by our presenters by holding control and scrolling with your mouse. So just like to also acknowledge um, the Boon Warung and the Bunurong people of the Kula Nation, which is from where we're presenting um, to you today down in Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, and pay my respects uh, to their um, elders past, present, and also emerging. Um, so Discovery Eye, we sponsor the event um, in terms of sort of uh, virtual sponsorship is paying for the meetup and sort of hosting it, I suppose, these days. But um, what we do is really focused around Power BI training and mentoring, largely in the environmental space, um, development of Power BI custom visuals, of which you'll see one presented by Pat later on today, end-to-end um, -to -end Power BI reporting solutions. Uh, we like to apply graphic design skills in terms of clever communication to the dashboards that we build. So as part of that, we work within the Adobe suite to develop infographics and animations to really help explain what can be quite complex data to everyday sort of users and a wide range of audiences, and also custom web app um, capacity within our team as well. Um, also like to just thank Reza and Layla, based out of Auckland in New Zealand. Um, they've been able to provide for the last few meetups now a free one month subscription to their Radicat Academy online learning course, which is chock full of um, amazing online resources that you can learn, not just Power BI, but also SQL and a lot of other topics, you know, artificial intelligence. For those people that know Layla Tati, she's an AI MVP as well as a BI MVP. So, just got a lot of lot of fantastic resources up there, um, including a custom visual development course designed by Daniel Marsh Patrick, who works as part of our team. Um, yeah, so would highly recommend people checking it out. But we're also excited to be able to give away a prize for it today. Um, and the prize is for so today's question: looking at Energy and Power BI. Question isn't really associated with Energy and Power BI, but question <laughs> is. So Power BI March release was last week. We want to know from people on the call, what was your favorite feature and why? Encourage people to come off mute and provide their answer, but first one to do it will win, win a prize. Hi, Simon. Are you wanting to, to share your favorite feature? Simon? Yes, please. Yeah, would you like to share your favorite feature? Sorry, yeah, we yeah, it's a drill through. A drill through. Is that released in the March version? So every month, Power BI updates. Yeah. Oh. I, I agree though. Yeah, drill, drill through is awesome. I think drill through is a fantastic yeah. feature. I think we've got, we've got maybe up. someone else with a hand up. Uh, Amen, if you wanted to go off mute and ask oh, and, and say your favorite. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if it was just released in March, but I just found about it is the, the search option or like a new search bar where you can search more than just your um, what the report, but it seems like it was a, a new discovery for me. So I believe it was recently out. Yeah, no, that's an awesome feature. And I'm actually not 100% sure if it was March or February. Does anyone on the call know whether that was released in February? Yeah, I believe that was last release. Yeah, oh, that's an awesome one, but I only just kind of noticed it as well. We've but got a few other. It's up there, top. top we've got a few there. other hands raised. Um, Kramali, did you want to uh, come up mute and let us mute? know? Yeah, so for me, uh, the best feature for the March update it was a color picker. So it was so easy uh, with the color picker. Uh, feature to choose and combine uh, combination with the different uh, shades and it's easier to um, you know uh, change the whole theme of uh, your page of your report yeah, yeah no I like awesome it. i think so color picker was released in feb but they did have the update in march so that's um, oh. <laughs> now, um you know coming coming you know 
really appreciating and putting in a lot of design-based yeah. features in the work that we do. I, I totally agree. The colour pick, especially the big February release, haven't been able to explore the March updates too much, but um, I know yeah. there were some upgrades. Do you so. know for bonus points what the update was, or does anyone uh, know what the update was to the colour picker in March? So it, it says here, I got it up, it says, uh, Thanks for the feedback. Based on the feedback this month, we've changed the colour picker to prioritise popping up on the right side so that less of it overlaps with the report canvas. And they also release some bug fixes. Yep. Awesome. So it's in terms of placement and sort of UI uh, base as well. But um, cool. no, I'm happy happy with that. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, we'll just write down uh, we'll just, to Kramali. Yeah. yeah, we'll save your email and we'll send you an email afterwards um, and connect you up with Reza for the free one month subscription. That's excellent. Thank you so thanks. much, guys. Oh, awesome. Thanks thank so you much. so much. And thanks for paying attention to all of the updates. Yeah. Um, and thanks, everyone else, for putting in your answers to great, great features with the drill through and also with the, um, the search bar as well. So yeah. thanks. Okay. And on to now today's agenda. So as I've sort of introduced um, before, we've got Mwen from SA Power Networks. We'll be talking about dashboard creation for bird nests and stoby poles. And then we've got Pat who will be talking about the marginal cost curve, uh, custom visual, which has just been released. Um, and I guess without further ado, when I'm happy to pass it over to you, mate, if you wanted to share screens and we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Before I jump into the presentation, if people can see my uh, webcam, I'll just briefly show something we're doing. Well, I'm presenting currently from our uh, SFL Networks, I suppose, robotics lab. So behind me. Oh, yeah, we can see that. We've got. <laughs> oh, wow. A um, robot that we're planning on using for autonomous asset inspection. Wow. So um, have a look at our social media channels and uh, we'll be releasing more information about Spot and what we're doing with Spot um, on there. That's cool. that is very cool. And when after your presentation, get you just to share those those social media channels and we'll distribute them as part of it. Is that that's do, does he get your coffees for you? That's awesome. <laughs> One day, possibly. <laughs> you can carry 13 kilos, so coffee wouldn't be a problem for it. <laughs> that's easy. Wow, wow, that's very that cool. That is very cool. Thanks. <laughs> so Thanks. So let's get into today. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, perfect. Great, great. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. So uh, I want to talk about bird nests and stoby poles, bit of an interesting combination of subjects, I suppose. So a bit of background. So my name is Moen Chen. I work at SA Power Networks as a data scientist. So I spend basically half of my time in the data science space, space sort of mainly as a, as a great way of communicating our findings and uh, insights from the work we do in data science in terms of uh, machine learning, uh, reinforcement learning with a robot like Spot and you know, object detection off of our um, inspection photographs, which I'll, you'll see some very shortly. So previously I was using Tableau for a few years and then recently we've moved on to Power BI as an organization which really helps with, you know, disseminating uh, dashboards and uh, uh, interactivity uh, reports and such, um, because we've got, you know, all the uh, Microsoft infrastructure in terms of Active Directory and SharePoint and Teams. Um, so recently, we're also moving into the um, Power Apps and Power Automate um, space. So in terms of building automation, building custom applications for specific um, customer groups. And um, sometimes just even building a simple macro just to help someone uh, do something repetitive very quickly. So some people might know Auto Hotkey. That's a primary tool for us to build like macros for, uh, you know, whether it's um, repeating the SAP um, transaction or uh, just fixing something they need to do in between applications. So um, I'm a big fan of birds. I don't know much about them, but you know I do find them really cool. You know they can fly. They're really fluffy, and uh, yeah. So uh, you know I do a bit of photography on the side, and this is one of the pictures I took um, a few years ago now at a wildlife park. 
and I thought, you know, it's just really good that we get to do something that helps them out as well. So, SA Power Networks. So, we are the uh, distribution network within South Australia. Uh, some of this you might have heard from Kerry before, so apologies if that's the case. Um, so, what you see there is a Stolby pole. Uh, Stolby poles are a bit of a South Australian special. So, um, instead of wooden poles or concrete poles, we've got this thing which has two steel beams, which you can see there, that brownish reddish color um, and concrete in between. So they're pretty long lasting, but as you can imagine, they're very, uh, their failure modes and degradation is very different from a wooden pole. The biggest issue we face is corrosion um, in terms of asset degradation. So the closer to the beach they are, uh, the more likely they're going to rust relatively quickly. Uh, so to look after our poles, we inspect them on multi-year cycles, depending on which corrosion zone and bushfire risk area they're in. So they might be on a five-year cycle or a 10-year cycle. And every year before bushfire season starts, we also send out ground patrols and helicopter patrols around our bushfire areas just to make sure uh, we do our best in terms of eliminating any potential risks. One of which is unfortunately, you know, build, uh, birds building nests uh, on top of our stoby poles. So here's an example of one. So what you're seeing there is on top of the Stolby pole, we've got a pole mount transformer. So that box there in gray. Um, so that's converting the um, voltage from the three conductors at the top and then um, most likely reducing it. I'm not an engineer, by the way, so uh, I'm pretty good with uh, trying to say in lay layman's terms. So if someone here actually knows a lot more, they can please do you know, uh, jump in and help elaborate. Um, yeah, so these transformers run pretty warm and um, there's the live conductors all over the place, but um, you know, for some reason, uh, a, a, some birds have decided that they would prefer to build their nests there. And <laughs> that's a, that presents a significant risk for us in terms of starting a fire, as you can imagine, because those dry uh, branches and twigs can be uh, quite easily become tinder for, um, for starting a fire. Um, so aside from those type of scenarios, we've also got these things called pole top junction boxes, as you can see top left. So there are smaller boxes on top of these Sobe poles that we've got, and um, you know, we've got these little holes at the bottom of them, and then we've got this really small bird species that like to build their nests within them. Um, so we've got procedures in place at SA Power Networks for identifying what type of bird has made that home based on you know, the, the birds that we see with the eggs and any protective species we call fauna rescue and make sure they take properly uh, looks after. Similarly, you know, sometimes we, uh, our crews out there find baby birds, you know, hatchlings, nestlings and fledglings. And um, we've got, again, a work instruction in place to allow the crew to, to identify you know, what type of bird they're looking at and making sure that we do the right thing when it comes to uh, protecting them and um, you know, making a substitute nest sometimes even when we, uh, when we have the ability to do so. So um, yeah, so basically every year as we go through these inspections and uh, patrols, we generate a lot of work for our crews to make sure um, that we eliminate these risks before they um, uh, before they become issues for us uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, I mean, the last thing we want is, is starting a fire, basically. So uh, this is the dashboard we built for that purpose. So uh, as you can see, we're now past the, the uh, we're near the end of the bushfire season for this year now. So all of the jobs are completed. So basically um, that's a full circle completed jobs, but uh, as you can see with the layout, the, the, the idea is we, we should show what type of uh, jobs are outstanding, where they are, you know, which um, depot we've got that's responsible for it, and um, you know where the, the job is. Uh, so it's a pretty simple Power BI dashboard, but it's picking up data out of SAP um, visualizing it in a map and we've got this really cool HTML page embedded in here. So I'll show that very briefly. So for example, if I am a ops supervisor for say, you know, Murray Bridge, 
I can select the jobs there. I can say, okay, so about half of them are in a median bushfire risk area. So I can zoom into those. So we're pretending, you know, we, we just found them. They haven't been done yet. So it's the responsibility of the depot to look into them and say, okay, so how big of risk is that presenting? And when do we need to get to them, you know, before bushfire season starts? And to be able to, you know, with that single view, single dashboard to go, oh, there we go, there's actually a little bird right there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm randomly picking, so I didn't know what to expect. Um, as you can see, you know, that's uh, from a helicopter patrol from that top down view. Uh, they find this, they generate the job, the job goes into SAP, and then uh, the devil can see it immediately in here and be able to organize and schedule when they can go about. Um, doing the, uh, the work required. So I am just seeing if I can look around, find another one. It's saying uh, that one there. So that's in our narrow port depots area. So this image viewer is a uh, web app on our intranet. And uh, previously, you know, you had to copy your um, job number out of SAP and then copy it into this website. But having all of this in Power BI directly like this, the turnaround speed for them to scope out what they need to do and schedule it in place, and evaluate the risk, find out where it is on Google Maps, all of that happens basically in seconds. So it's um, it's something that you know, really opened their eyes towards the capabilities and functionality within a, a system like this, even with just simple uh, ways of visualizing data to be able to go um, directly across all of these applications and be able to um, arrange and organize their work. And that's something we presented internally across a couple of uh, platforms in IT and you know, business groups. And uh, yeah, so you know, really, really strong uh, positive feedback there, and that's led to a lot of growth in our Power BI space in terms of what people want to try to uh, use Power BI for, um, whether it's um, looking at other types of work or looking at financial analyses. Or, uh, yeah, so a lot of different um, interesting ideas that people have come up with just because they've seen this and they realize now how useful it is to be able to, um, you know, visualize data and combine that with the sort of geographical context, which you know is a massively important factor for a widely distributed uh, network like ours, and be able to look at images from the ground and reduce the number of times out to send a truck out there to you know, re-examine things. So um, that's it from me. Um, do we have any questions? I'll stop presenting. That was really awesome, Wen. It's so oh, nice to see real world applications. It's very interesting. I loved the um, the image viewer you had on the right there. Is that uh, embedded in Power BI using the HTML content? That's exactly right. Yeah. So Kerry showed me that one, and uh, you know we um, just changed the URL based on what the job number is, and it works flawlessly. Yeah. Oh, that's to be able awesome. to expand it, you know, as the full screen visual is just hugely useful for the guys because it turn, yeah it take previously you know it's at least 10 minutes just to get all that information in one place and now it's just second awesome. we've actually got a uh, daniel mash patrick on the one who develops the html content so um, oh wow that's, yeah that's awesome so that's big praise and good yeah. feedback so i'm sure daniel will be enjoying that oh yeah. so he just wrote in the chat today, awesome. but no great presentation uh, Thank I think um, we had a few questions, but I saw Michael Berry, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? First? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> no, nice report. Kind of the question I have is around or well, two. So with the HTML viewer, how, how do they sign in? Does it does it pop, does it use a single sign on or do they have to authenticate in the HTML? That's the great thing because everything's integrated to through single sign on now between the Office 365, that HANA. You know, all of these platforms that IT have put together, it, they, there is no sign-in process at all. And it just as long as you're on our corporate network, it works. So oh, even yeah. if the crew is out in a truck, you know, they've got a Wi-Fi connection to our network there, they can see it immediately. So 
mountains awesome. out there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and with the with the images, are they? So I noticed you had some historical ones. So are they checking every poll every time, like every year, or do you have like a risk rating, or is it a schedule, or what's the? Yeah. So uh, we assess polls on either five-year or ten-year cycles, depending on whether it's a high bushfire risk area and depending on whether it's a high corrosion zone. So, yeah, higher risk ones get checked more often. But as you can imagine, five years is still a bit of a long time, which is why we found the spot uh, to help them out. So the idea is if you can um, have the robot take more pictures um, and save the inspector from doing it, um, the inspector can focus their time on examining the actual um, assets rather than thinking, oh, have I taken the picture yet? You know, what else do I, is it the right angle and things like that? OK, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we had one more question. I think I know the answer. Uh, Sumen just wanted to know if that dashboard was available publicly or if that's an internal dashboard. Yeah. Uh, it's internal. So we have a few premium workspaces. Uh, so we have a few analysts and data scientists who publish through those and then the rest of the business can see. Yeah. And we have um, basically um, a, a active directory groups. I think that's how they're usually organized so, so that um, asset management sees asset management reports and, and they only get invited into other groups' reports. Um, yeah. No, excellent. Fantastic. Oh, that was a really good presentation. Were there any other questions from the group? No. No, uh, well, look, thanks, Mike. It's great to see that, like, you know, what you presented today has really helped to drive Power BI within the organisation. Because quite often, you know, that that can be a challenge. It's like that that culture shift and people then understanding how this tool can be used for their own data and other business applications. So, yeah, thanks a lot for sharing, and that was that was really cool. So, no worries. Thank you. Like, anything for environmental protection, you know, I mean, <laughs> so it's all very good. So, no, thanks a lot. Um, um, yeah, no, so now we've got um, our second presentation for today from um, Pat Booth. Uh, so Pat will be presenting on the new marginal cost curve uh, visual in um, uh, available for Power BI. So uh, take it away, Pat. Okay, I'll just uh, share out my screen. Right, everyone see that okay? I'll, yeah. I'll leave it in... Uh, non-presentation mode so that um, I can flick between some of the uh, demonstration that I've got for the visual. Um, but essentially this uh, this visual is a collaboration between uh, Alice and Christian at Discovery I, myself at MeC Solutions and uh, Daniel Mars Patrick at uh, Coersa. So um, we've been developing this visual over the course of the last, uh, what would say, three months, Alice, perhaps. And um, re really, really pleased to be able to present uh, this visual to you today and perhaps give you a little bit of context in the reason why we've uh, approached development of, uh, of this particular visual and its application in the energy space. So uh, we're faced with um, unprecedented change in our energy systems here in Australia and particularly here on the east coast of Australia. And it has really raised concerns about um, what we would typically call the energy trilemma. And it's that balance of energy security, sustainability and affordability. And it's um, really a tight balancing act with, uh, as we get more and more renewable penetration into, uh, into the grid, it really is a balancing act to be able to uh, keep that energy security and also uh, the costs down at the same time. So what um, we have here in the national electricity market is um, you know, probably the, the biggest geographical uh, area of coverage in the world in terms of uh, an interconnected system. But our system here in Australia essentially trades in five regions um, covering those eastern states and not including the WA market, which is subject to a, a separate 
uh, grid and uh, interconnected system as it's called. Um, in this system, we have largely uh, coal-fired stations providing uh, base load capacity to sustain the demand that we have. And those uh, coal-fired stations do have a finite life and do um, you know, produce the majority of the emissions in our electricity generation sector as it stands at the moment. So most people would agree that transitioning to more renewable sources of energy um, is definitely the way of the future, but that must be done in a sustainable fashion. So what we are essentially looking at when we're trying to balance the network, it's a combination of both the supply or the generation and the demand that is being experienced. And to keep those uh, balanced in real time, we essentially schedule um, according to what's called a merit order or um, you know, mer merit order or in some uh, AEMO cases, that's AEMO as the market operator, they typically call this security constrained economic dispatch. So whilst they try to achieve the most economic and lowest cost outcome, it is constrained by system security requirements to keep the lights on. Um, that raises a few questions about how people are actually bidding, not just those baseload coal-fired or natural gas-fired stations, but also the variable or renewable energy sources, which um, in most cases we know uh, are subject to quite a deal of variation. And I'll just uh, bring up the template. So here is um, a plot in the last seven days of the generation which has been dispatched across the NEM to support that uh, demand uh, over the last seven days. So as you can see here, most of that um, capacity is provided by black coal fired stations, um, uh, you know, relatively about a, a quarter or thereabouts by the brown coal fired stations in Victoria. And then these renewable uh, sources, wind, water and solar provide um, just under a quarter of it at the moment of that, uh, of that generation. What's not shown on any of these charts is the, um, the demand that the AEMO or the market operator does not see. Um, so that's the rooftop solar, which is so small that it effectively um, provides negative demand. Right in terms of that, uh, in terms of that balance between the supply and the demand. So, in order to determine the most economic price, the generators, regardless essentially of their fuel type, are scheduled in merit order of the price that they bid, but also the volume um, according to bidding rules, which are. Uh, quite quite complex to understand and provide all uh, a hell of a lot of data to actually analyse. And that uh, combination of price and volume um, cannot really dis be displayed in the appropriate context uh, with the core visuals that are provided in Power BI currently. Some people have gone to uh, great lengths to create the concept of the marginal cost curve or merit order curve in Excel. And the only way that you can do that in Excel is to pre-rank uh, those projects or opportunities in the cost order, then the amount of volume at that particular price calculate the total cumulative amount and then divide by an appropriate increment in order to display these types of graphs within Excel with the help of a bit of VBA code typically. All right. 
So what we've produced with the merit order curve, and I'll just, uh, I won't steal Alison Christian's thunder on the, uh, the abatement curve that they've produced on their uh, website for demo purposes, but I'll um, just go quickly here to one of the examples that we've developed using uh, the new merit order, or sorry, MCC custom visual. So this displays uh, essentially all of the potential uh, bidding sources by both the price that they have bid and the volume that they have bid incrementally. Um, generators are permitted to uh, bid in any one of up to 10 uh, price bands and they can put those prices in only once per day, but they can modify the volume that they bid in each of those bands at any time up to the five minute pre-dispatch interval uh, at the real time of dispatch. So what this visual is configured to show is those um, bids in the merit order and I've configured the visual to display those by the fuel type. In this case, you can see that, you know, where we would typically land for dispatch um, on the average demand line, which is one of the configurable properties of the visual, um, is referenced to this X axis, which is the cumulative amount of uh, energy or generation that is dispatched in price merit order. So you can see here, we have a market floor of a minus a thousand megawatts, and we have a maximum cap of about $15,000 in most regions at the moment. And it's very, very difficult to see across the range of typical demands, what prices are actually um, you know, being bid because the curve is so this cumulative amount of demand. Um, and as we can see during the middle of the day, I'll just put the play axis on here. During the day, that demand will change and the price will also change, but it's very difficult at this scale in the Y axis to display exactly what that average price is. You can see it's hovering around the $50 mark here in the visual in the left hand side. So this is sending the hour of the day to the custom visual at five, uh, sorry, one second increments, and you can see the responsiveness of the visual, even though it's configured to take the full range of values on the y-axis. Um, in order to really drill in on the, um, the point, we needed to configure the visual or have the ability to configure the visual such that um, it would display adequately the range around which we would typically dispatch in a particular region. So for that reason, we decided to put a property of um, an ability here to custom uh, adjust the values in both the x-axis and the y-axis, start and end, and then clip the visual uh, through the use of these arrow indicators, both on the upside and the downside, to, um, to illustrate with, with a greater degree of granularity what is happening around the typical dispatch point. So all of the properties that you would expect out of a, you know, out of a core visual have been incorporated into the custom visual and the MCC. 
So you can see here the, the typical properties that most users would be uh, familiar with in terms of the ability to adjust data colors, uh, in terms of the ability to adjust um, font sizes, colors in our X and Y axis. Um, I've already mentioned the ability to uh, adjust the start and end values in the axis and also to be able to incorporate into our um, analysis uh, through our visual the ability to put uh, reference lines or reference values that may be driven by measures, so they may be driven dynamically in both the X and the Y axis. And that's the feature that I'm taking advantage of here when I'm using the play axis slicer um, to dynamically change both the average demand indicated here and the average price of dispatch, which is indicated in the Y axis. So all of those um, features that you would typically find in a Power BI core visual have been incorporated into the MCC. Um, you know, the title, background properties, um, ability to shadow, but interestingly, we've also incorporated the ability to tooltip. So any of the tooltips, even though I've got just the basic tooltip displayed here, I'm sure uh, Alice and Christian will display on their uh, dashboard the ability to actually generate custom tooltips and also put those tooltips into um, a tooltip within the custom visual. We've also incorporated um, the ability to drill through. Um, whilst I haven't configured it in this particular um, report for development, there is the ability on a right click um, to actually drill through. Um, and it, it hasn't been hooked up here, so that's the reason why it's not displaying. But the property is there to allow the ability to drill through for a greater degree of detail and granularity through the visual. Okay, so that's, um, I'll allow Alice and uh, perhaps Christian to display the, um, the example using their, um, using the demo that's available on their website. And perhaps towards the end, I'll take any, um, any questions that uh, people might have and, and maybe if we've got time, show uh, a few more of the things that we're um, we're working on. Well, that was awesome. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, and it really shines through. Pat works in the uh, energy sector. Um, he came to us with a very awesome idea for a cool custom visual. So it's amazing what can happen when you get collaboration across industry as well. Um, yeah, so we're really excited to partner with both Pat and Daniel on this to create um, uh, help bring this custom visual out to other people who might want to use it. So I'll just quickly show you um, uh, another very quick demo of what we've got. Um, and this just shows you what can what you can do when you can work with other people uh, across this industry as well. So we've taken exactly the same um, uh, data that uh, that Pat's provided to us and we've really just presented in, in a way that hopefully uh, can help uh, share that data story about what this uh, awesome visual uh, that, that Daniel created can do. Um, so here we've got a slightly different example here. We've got a greenhouse gas emissions example. Um, so it's not just useful for uh, for kind of cost scenarios, cost and demand, but also um, for the abatement, considering abatement of, um, of CO2 emissions uh, per cost as well. Um, so you can see that we can have report page tooltips. Uh, you can use lots of the really nice design features in Power BI and combine it with, uh, with visuals that, um, that the end users are really familiar with as well. 
we've given a little bit more context in the text box on the left about what the visual is trying to do. So it goes a little bit to what Pat was talking about. Um, use the what if parameter slider there. Um, so say you have a target abatement level, you can select what that level is and then get updates in both the visual but also in the um, cards at the top and explaining what that sort of means uh, in terms of what you have to achieve to reach that target abatement. Yeah, so we've got a couple other ones. I think Pat's um, run through these as well. This is an example of how you could uh, uh, visualise a commodity cost curve. Um, again, having a look at Australia, China, and the rest of the world. Yep. And then also the example that Pat's um, uh, just very quickly walked through, uh, showing the, the play axis here, how you can... Um, uh, have a look at the changes in uh, the, the average price and demand over a typical day for different uh, states. You can drill into lots more information as well. So it really does depend on um, how you want to use this visual. It's a very flexible uh, visual. And I'll just show you, it's up on, if anyone wants to play around with it, um, we've got it up on our website, very fresh this morning. <laughs> Um, so we just put it up there next to the bore log as well. Um, so you can have a look at a, a little demo GIF here. Um, and you can also take it for a test drive. So you can interact uh, with this report here as well and click around and uh, have a think and get inspired with uh, a new way of uh, visualizing your um, energy, uh, energy data, but also um, uh, including other factors into the mix. And like, like Alice touched on at the start, sort of Pat came to us with this idea. He's got a lot more of the sort of experience in the energy field, um, whereas Alice and I are more in the water and environmental space. But it seemed like a cool idea, but also, you know, being able to present a lot more visibility to what is quite a complex scenario that is, uh, you know, we understand quite commonly based in the energy sector. So, yeah, we're happy to make it available. And it's been really nice working with both Daniel, uh, custom visual developer and Pat with the domain knowledge and bringing the ideas forward. So Yeah, so just uh, this is a paid uh, visual because um, as Pat mentioned, it's been almost um, a couple of months in the making, but I think it really does provide a lot of additional value if people are already creating reports uh, that use this data, then you can present it in a much more efficient, efficient manner. Um, and if other people out there, if you do have ideas for custom visuals um, or ideas you wanted to chat about, then um, we're always looking for new opportunities to kind of bring these very bespoke visuals to our sector, because we know that Power BI is a tool really developed for people in kind of finance, sales, logistics. And so if there are other uh, visuals that you're using or that you would love to be able to use in Power BI, um, then we're going to try and make that happen as well. Um, so that's that's probably all from our end. Um, Pat, we'll open it up else? to... Um, Pat, did you have anything more to add or should we go to the questions now? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. So. Yeah, awesome. There, there is a lot more that I could show, but yeah, I, I think we all uh, want to get out of here on time. Ah, <laughs> yeah, no, I love seeing the real world applications. Um, uh, I think, Michael, you got a question again, mate? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, for the for the people who are, are viewing that report uh, in terms of the energy sector, what's the what's the action that they that they take out of it? Was for someone who's not in the energy sector, it's not especially clear. Like, if if I'm accessing that report and looking at it, what what are the things that I'm going to do after seeing a particular feature on there? Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll have a shot at that one because, um, you know, essentially, you know, companies, you know, particularly large organisations at the moment are making all sorts of um, commitments to sustainability targets. And a lot of those sustainability targets are driven by a, essentially an, a, an abatement or an emissions outcome. Those um, targets um, have a range of different opportunities to, to meet those targets and um, not all of them will be economically optimised. So, you know, typically the, the finances and, and the accountants of the world would uh, run these models to try and uh, determine the relative merit of a particular opportunity 
um, in order to meet that target. And they may be combinations of both physical projects um, and also financial projects. So it's important to be able to analyze those on a common base and, and with the similar context that is needed um, for that type of analysis. So by displaying those opportunities, particularly in the case of a marginal abatement cost curve, which is one specific application of the MCC, in order to determine, you know, uh, and, and display quite quickly and concisely what our target is going to be and how many projects we have to execute with what capital in order to meet that target in an economically optimised fashion, right? So that may be a combination of both physical projects and financial investment, for example, um, a company might decide that uh, in purchasing all of their energy consumption as renewable, they would be effectively paying what's called an LGC cost of 100% of their demand or their, their consumption. Now, that may not be, given the price of LGCs over time, which is reducing, but it may not be uh, economically efficient over and above projects that they may be able to execute within their own control to reduce emissions or become more energy efficient. Those projects will typically land on the left-hand side of the cost curve, of the merit order curve. And the more of those projects within your control that you can execute at lower overall cost, the better your economic outcome will be while still achieving the target that you have set. So, you, so you'd essentially just have a look at whatever projects fall in that left-hand side of the, of the curve and then you'd target them as projects that you'd look to implement because they are falling below Below the the mean of of the uh, the whole curve, right? And no, if you're, uh, it's nothing nothing to do with the mean. It it is to do with exactly what projects need to be executed in order to achieve the target, either emission or sustainability goal that you want. Right. So it's it's only because the visual is is doing all of those things that uh, previously we've had to do using quite complex VBA in Excel in order to rank the projects in the order that they appear, sort them into that table dynamically, calculate the cumulative amount of each project's abatement, then put those in order across the cumulative x-axis and then try and chart it by putting incremental um, increments of the lowest common denominator across in, in the Excel uh, VBA script. It, it's an absolute nightmare. But, you know, all, um, all firms that run a, a forecast stream investment you know, type analysis would have access to the data that is required to essentially populate a table, regardless of um, price order, regardless of the volume that each incremental opportunity provides. And this visual will then do all of that work for you. Well, that was awesome, Pat. Thanks. Um yeah, thanks so much for the extra context. And I think that's a really important point because uh, all of us working across the environmental or energy sector, um, we're all very, uh, we have a very intimate knowledge of our own data and the way that uh, the regulators or other people are very used to seeing our data presented. And that's where sometimes Power BI can be a little bit challenging because out of the box, uh, we've got a ton of visuals, but 
none are bespoke enough for exactly the application that we're looking for. So this is a very, well, it's a pretty specific application we're presenting today. It's got lots of wide ranging um, opportunities for anything, I think, which is assessing uh, uh, price and demand and putting all those factors together into one really nice visual with a bit of extra context, a bit of maybe it needs a little bit more narrative around what it's showing. Um, you can get a really great outcome and also all that data processing that Pat was talking about, which we all know is incredibly painful in Excel. Uh, we can take advantage, we can do that. That's super easy, that's bread and butter for Power BI. Um, but then it's thinking, okay, if we have this idea, there's there, there are a few new tools coming out in Power BI to allow us as BI developers uh, to be able to take advantage of those. So Muen showed us one, which was using uh, the HTML content visual to take to uh, like in, introduce another visual into Power BI uh, just by having the right uh, HTML tags. Uh, Pat's showed us a really cool one. We can go. Uh, you can really like nicely design it, write a custom visual. You need a lot of programming skills for that. So that's where people like Daniel come in. Um, but there's also tools out there like Charticulator, which is um, a bit of an in-between. We can use Charticulator to create our own custom bespoke visuals without writing any code for Power BI. You can use the R and Python visuals uh, if you're used to those programming languages. And Daniel's going to be introducing a brand new visual at the Power BI Summit. So this is uh, the Global Power BI Summit happening in April, um, which Reza and Layla are organizing. So I won't steal Daniel's thunder, but there's another uh, uh, like kind of, uh, what do we call it? Like a BI developer um, uh, focused visual coming out there very soon. So um, I think it's super exciting. I love the I love the different applications that, uh, that Pat showed us today as well. And, I know that we didn't do it justice, but we just saw Pat's enthusiasm and passion for this amazing visual that he really wanted. So we're like, oh, that sounds really cool. And the beauty of it all is, Alice has just gone through a lot of different examples. R, Python, you can get as complex as you want with the custom visual development. But then it's also for as simple as you want with drag and drop into a canvas. And even sometimes then that can have a really positive effect on the business for decision making and bringing visibility to your data. So it really does cover a broad, broad spectrum. So yeah, that's why we love Power BI. That's why I'm sure a lot of you, all of you on the call, love Power BI as well. But um, yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Pat, a lot for the presentation. We've um, got another five minutes. Are there any last uh, questions for either Pat or Moen? Otherwise, we'll just we'll just wrap up. Um, just, I'll just share screens two seconds. Um, so as per usual, just wrapping up with this today. Um, thanks to Wen and Pat for your very interesting presentations. It was great to bring a bit of the energy sector applications in. Um, as you mentioned, and there are a few questions in the chat, we have recorded the session today and we'll make it available on our, both our blog and our YouTube channel. Um, if anyone has ideas for future sessions, we're, uh, we'll actually be having our next session in May um, and we're still trying to lock in presenters even though we have a few ideas. So if you'd like to get involved, Feel free to send us an email. It doesn't have to be complex. It can be how you how you got started with Power BI and the sort of resources you enjoy. Just anything to sort of share that knowledge because everyone comes from a you know whole whole range of skill sets and uh, technical abilities. So we're looking to hear from anyone out there on the call. So feel free to um, get in contact and give us your idea. And thank you as always for everyone for dialing in. I know we've. Uh, Got a few of the regular people, Fernando from Mexico and um, Jose from Colombia. So yes, yeah, so international people and also people within Australia. Thanks, thanks a lot. It's, uh, yeah, thank going. you so much. And we also have um, we also have Daniel on the call as well. Daniel, sorry, just in the last couple of minutes, did you want to say anything about uh, uh, the visual or um, or uh, anything that uh, you've been working on? Hello. <coughs> Yeah, yep. perfect. Oh, yeah, no, I, um, it's kind of nice to be quiet sometimes and just see what other people are doing. They were great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I don't really have anything specific to add. I'm, I'm keen if anyone's got any questions, I could answer some stuff. But yeah, no, just uh, thanks for such a great session. Now, for those people that don't don't know Daniel, he's based out of Christchurch in New Zealand. He works with our team. He's, you know, Daniel, I'm gonna, I know you don't like pumping up your tires, but Microsoft <laughs> MVP, custom vision <laughs> developer, he's, uh, he's technically very sound at um, you know, Power BI and in particular is passionate about developing the visuals. So 
part of his passion has come through like in the way that we've developed this project and sort of got the end result and it's been really nice to work with people that you know do, do uh, are actually really interested in the sort of work that you're putting out there so yeah um got yeah a few more minutes if anyone does have any questions or if you just want to introduce yourself feel free to come off mute and show your video um otherwise yeah um thanks very much and Free to leave. If you <laughs> yeah, thank you for all the comments in the chat. It looks like everyone uh, really enjoyed it. So just thanks again to Moen and Pat, um, especially for your time presenting. It, it was really interesting. I love seeing all the real world applications, especially yeah. the robot. <laughs> that was that cool. robot was cool. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Oh, good to see everyone. Is Wally still up? Yeah, Dad's still on. Hey, Dad. <laughs> well yeah i mean we, we might wrap it up there um and yeah thanks again guys we really appreciate the sessions and the time that you've put in to prepare them and uh yeah thanks very much to everyone for dialing in it's great okay we'll uh oh, we'll, we'll wrap we'll it up there cool. awesome thanks everybody thank enjoy you. the rest of your days thanks see you later bye thank you thanks bye-bye